Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, we pray, speak in this place, in the calming of our minds and the longing of our hearts, by the words of my lips and the thoughts that we form. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. Amen. If there is a question that has caused people to ponder over the generations, it's what is the meaning of love? What is love all about? Songwriters and poets have written about love since time began. As long as there has been a church, ministers have preached about love. And we've talked about it so many times. This morning the Apostle Paul gives his exhortation on love to the Corinthian congregation. Corinth was a city in Greece, one of its largest, with a population even in Paul's time of 75,000 people. It's a city that was established about 150 years before Jesus, destroyed and then rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 44 B.C. It had two deep and wide harbors, which made it an excellent seaport for the commercial trade between Europe and Asia. It was an important stop for Mediterranean trade routes, and it did a flourishing business in trade. Long before Christianity, Corinth was a very religious town. On top of a hill near the seaport was the temple of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. A temple dedicated to her was there, and it was said to be populated by thousands of temple priestesses. Just like when I went to the Philippines, they told us prostitution is illegal, but for a certain fee, you can spend an evening with hostess. <laughs> so it was that sailors coming into the Corinthian port were more than happy to visit Aphrodite's temple and leave their gift with one of the temple priestesses. <laughs> there was also a temple to Dionysius, the Greek god of wine and intoxication, and another one to Isis, the Greek, the Egyptian god of magic. So Corinth, to say the least, was a very ungodly town. And among Corinth's, Corinth's many visitors were sailors and tradesmen. And so these are the ones who, like the song goes, gave love a bad name. <laughs> and to that kind of environment, Paul comes and establishes a Christian congregation. And it was a prosperous congregation in a number of ways. Sure, it had its poor people, people who struggled to find food for their daily meals, but they also had a number of very wealthy members in their congregation. Unfortunately, the wealthy didn't share with the poor, and so Paul had to address that. We had people in the congregation who were very devout in their faith, but their loyalty was not to Jesus, but rather to the minister who had proclaimed Jesus to them. And some said they were loyal to Apollos, and some said they were loyal to Paul. On top of all that, you have the nature of spiritual gifts. And we've talked about that in the last couple of weeks that God's Holy Spirit had blessed these Corinthians with some remarkable abilities, gifts that included prophecy and healing and discernment and speaking in tongues, a language known and understood only by God, or 
people who had the ability to interpret what the tongue speakers said. What wound up happening was that people with these different gifts began acting as if their gift was more important than any of the other gifts. And so Paul writes to the congregation, and he describes for them, first of all, that the gift you've been given is the gift God wants you to have. It's the gift God intends for you to have. So if you have a gift and somebody else has something different, there's no superiority or inferiority there. It's the gift that God's Spirit doled out to you. And at the same time, he goes on to say that each of those gifts together are analogous to the different parts of the human body, where no one body part is more important than the other, because each has its own function. Each has its own purpose. And it's when they are put together that the body is able to function efficiently. And so now Paul builds on that. And in the last verse of chapter 12, he tells them, listen, if you're going to get hung up on what gift you've got, maybe you need to aspire to the greatest gift of all. And so he moves into what we have as chapter 13. And he says there that even if you're able to speak the languages of men or of angels, but have not love, it's like hollow noise. Now we know that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability to preach the first gospel message in languages they had never studied, in languages they had never learned, but nevertheless, in languages they were able to speak so that the various ethnic assemblage there in Jerusalem for the Pentecost feast could understand what they were saying. And here, even if you have the ability to speak directly to God in his own language, but if you're not doing it out of love, it's meaningless. In these Greek temples, typically when you went in to pray, you first needed to wake the god up. <laughs> Apparently, Greek gods were very sleepy. <laughs> and if nobody was around to address them, they would take naps. And so as you entered into the temple, there might be a large bell or a cymbal hanging from a cord. And you would take the attached hammer <laughs> and wake the god up. Okay. Aphrodite, hello, anybody home? It's just noise. And you're probably thinking it's an annoying noise at that. <laughs> Paul says, even if I can speak the languages of men and angels, but if my motivation for doing so is not love, it's just empty noise. And he goes on from there, in the second verse, to say that love is more important than knowledge. He says, you might know it all. You might know all there is to know about science or medicine or music. You might be able to understand mysteries. But if that knowledge is not shared out of love, it means nothing. Earlier in chapter 8, verse 1, he said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And it's with love that we strengthen one another. Now you've all met people who just love to share with you how much they know about a subject. I remember in my days as a youth, watching one of my favorite television programs, one that clearly now I realize was written for adults and not children, Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> there was a portion of that show called, Here's Mr. Know-It-All. Now you've all met a know-it-all. You've all worked with a know-it-all. 
You've all had a know-it-all as a neighbor. It's annoying, isn't it? It's like, I don't need to hear what you have to say. Because you're not saying it to build me up. You're saying it to make you look good. So that I'll be impressed with how much you know. At the same time, I had a friend who said, it's better to sit there silent and let people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Paul says that love is more important than knowledge. Love is even more important than faith. Now that sounds like a strange thing to say to Lutherans who have built our belief on the triad of grace, faith, and scripture. But faith means nothing without love. Think of what you believe this morning. Do you believe that God is the creator of the world? Do you believe that God sent Jesus into the world to be our savior? Do you believe that Jesus died for us so that our sins could be forgiven? and that he was raised to life three days later and is now preparing a place for us in heaven. If you believe all that, that's well and good. I commend you for that. But the Bible teaches that if we know and believe all the right things but do not have love, it's nothing. It's superficial and of no value. The priest and the Levite, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, had faith. They had knowledge. But yet when they came upon a wounded Samaritan, they passed by on the other side of the road. A wounded neighbor. It was the Samaritan who stopped and helped. Fourthly, love is more important than generosity. Paul says that we might possess, do all we possess to the poor, and even surrender our body to the flames and sacrifice, but if we have not love, we gain nothing. Think of the story in the Gospels where Jesus is seated by the treasury box in the temple. He and the disciples are sitting there and they're watching all the fat cats come in with their big offering and noisily dropping it into the box so that everybody will notice how generous they are. And then this lady comes with two copper coins and she generously gives those two coins and Jesus commends her for her love because she gave all she had for others. You see, generosity by itself is not enough. Now, like me, I'm sure you get calls all the time from people from some worthwhile organization asking you to contribute to their cause. But why would you give? Would you give because pastor preached a sermon on stewardship and giving? Would you give to shut them up and get them off the phone? <laughs> Or do you give because you believe in that cause and you genuinely, out of love, want to help those people? <clears throat> Paul says love is more important than spiritual gifts, more important than knowledge, more important than faith, more important than generosity. But he also asks us to practice love in our everyday lives. So maybe love is more important than anything we ever realized. Maybe love is the foundation for everything we believe and practice as a church. In John 13, Jesus tells the disciples shortly before his death that he's giving them a new commandment to love one another as he has loved them. And he goes on to say, if you love others as I have loved you, then by that all people will know that you are my disciples, that you are my followers. 
This congregation is not impressive because of its beauty. This congregation is not impressive because of its stirring and inspirational music, <laughs> which the pastor tries to lead you in each Sunday morning. This congregation is not impressive because of the good food we eat on potluck days. No. This congregation is impressive for the way it shows love to one another and for the way it shows love to the people around us. Perhaps you remember the Elvis Presley song with the lyric, I can't help falling in love with you. The Righteous Brothers pointed out that some poor lady has lost that loving feeling. And yet we also remember, hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? <laughs> From Jim Morrison and the Doors. The Beatles reminded us that all we need is love. But what we do with our love is what counts. In Philippians 2, Paul tells us each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, love the way Jesus loved us, selflessly, giving of himself for the benefit of others. Now we've said before how in the Greek New Testament there are three words, each of which can be translated as love. There's the reference to physical love. There's the reference to emotional love. But here in 1 Corinthians 13, we have the word agape, which means committed love. It's a decision. It's the same word you find in Ephesians 5, where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's the same word you find in 1 John's letters, where he talks about how people will know we are Christians by our love. And it's the word you find in John 3.16. For God loved the world so much, he made a decision. He gave his only son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As we consider this passage this morning, certainly we can apply what Paul is saying to husbands and wives that they would each consider the needs of the other more important than their own. But that power of love goes beyond that within the family context to the relationship we have with our children or with our parents. And what Paul is telling us here is that sometimes love's not easy. Sometimes you've got to make the difficult choice not out of anger, not out of a spirit of meanness, but out of love. Because I see it every week with parents who have allowed children to make their own decisions and as a result have put themselves on a path to destruction. And you wonder sometimes, you know, where was the discipline for those kids? I've said many times, you don't spoil a child by giving it too much love, since it's impossible to give a child too much love. No, you spoil a child when you don't set sufficient boundaries for the kid. But not just spouses, not just relationships with our parents or our siblings or our children, but Paul also calls us to love the grumpy next door neighbor. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's not easy for me to love Mario. Mario works for the Sun City Complaint Association, or whatever <laughs> it is that he does, the code enforcement group. Mario drives around the neighborhood all day long finding things that are wrong. 
So he can send you a letter that says, your grass is too high, you have too many weeds, your trash cans were left out too long. We've noticed that your license plate uh, date is not current. The shed in your backyard is too high. <laughs> I have my own definition for what HOA stands for, <laughs> but since this is church, I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> but I will share that at least the H stands for hell. <laughs> That's a good church word. I don't like Mario, but God doesn't ask me to like him. God asks me to love him. God asks me to make that decision to care for him. And so I am praying for Mario every day. <laughs> I pray that Mario will win the lottery, get the Powerball and move to Fiji, <laughs> and leave me alone. I read a story about a missionary named Doug Nichols that I'd like to share with you. Doug was a missionary to India, but unfortunately, he contracted tuberculosis and wound up being confined in a sanitarium. It was not a good place to be. It was not clean. The sanitary conditions are not what we would have in an American hospital. But nevertheless, Doug felt that he could be a missionary there. You know, bloom where you're planted. And so he tried distributing tracts and Bibles to some of the other patients, but had no success at all because he couldn't speak the language. And so the people just ignored him. Because of his tuberculosis, sometimes in the middle of the night, he would wake up having a horrible coughing fit and have to sit up in bed. And one night as he woke up, he noticed a man across the aisle from him, a frail elderly fellow, who looked to be rocking in bed, almost like he was trying to build up momentum so he could sit up, but was not succeeding. And in his own weakened condition, he chose to do nothing about it, went back to sleep. Waking up the next morning, he discovered that the man was rocking because he was trying to get up and go to the bathroom. Being unsuccessful in doing so, he soiled himself. Doug noticed that some of the nurses were very compassionate, but not all. Some were very mean, one even slapped him. The other patients were not all that tolerant either, complaining about the horrible smell that they had to endure. It was just a couple of nights later when Doug was awakened by another coughing fit and once again saw that the man was trying to get up. Despite his weakened condition, Doug got out of bed and crossed the aisle to where the other man lay. Placing the man's arms around his shoulders, he helped the man to stand. But in the man's weakened condition, he was incapable of walking to the bathroom. So Doug picked him up, he says, like a baby in his arms, and carried him into the room that was functioning as their bathroom, which was really nothing more than a room with a hole in the ground. And so Doug helped to support the man while he was able to take care of business, cleaned him up, and then put him back in bed. The next morning after breakfast, several of the other patients came over to see Doug and wanted to know what was in those tracts and brochures that he had been trying to distribute to them. You see, the thing is, they weren't interested in what he had to say until they saw what kind of a man he was. I've heard it said of congregations and of teachers and of pastors and of social workers and other caregivers, people won't care how much you know 
until they know how much you care. And that's the measure of who we are as a congregation. Doug, Doug was on to say to us, I didn't preach a sermon. I didn't read scripture to these people. I couldn't even communicate with them in their own language. I had no brilliant lesson to teach them. All I did was take an old man to the bathroom. You know, anyone can do that. This is the most excellent way to witness your faith. It's the way of Christ. Love one another as we have been loved. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We worship God with our offering.